everybody, thanks for joining me, Dr. Ross Marcagiani, with another great conversation at Turnpike Health and Wellness Center. Today we're going to be talking about SIBO. We'll be going into what SIBO is, how does someone get SIBO, what are some common signs and symptoms, some testing for SIBO, and then how we correct SIBO. Let's dive in. So first, really, what's going on when we're talking about SIBO? So first, we're going to talk about some, ana some anatomy something called the ileocecal valve. So think of this as like a door between the large intestine and the small intestine. And in the digestive process, the small intestine is before the large intestine. Large intestine is kind of like the last portion of the digestive system. When we're talking about the large intestine, the large intestine has the majority of the bacteria in, in that area. It's important for absorbing and helping to break down fiber, uh, helping to absorb water to form stool, and helping to absorb certain minerals. So that's really a key important. And then we have the small intestine, which is primarily, its primary job is to absorb the majority of the food we eat, whether it be fat soluble or water soluble vitamins um, and things along that nature. But in between these two is separated by a door called the ileocecal valve. And what happens here, when the environment changes, the pH changes, the pressure on the valve changes, or the, um, the tension on the valve changes, it causes for that door to be open. And now what we have, we have the bacteria from the small intestine changing homes and making a home in the small intestine where it shouldn't be. So we have this bacteria translocating from the large intestine into the small intestine. This kind of breeds a bad microbiome and causes more bad bacteria to kind of foster. It also uh, inhibits the migratory motor complex. So this is an autonomic uh, process, meaning automatic. It happens without us consciously doing it. And think of the migratory motor complex as like a sweeping system or a wave-like system that helps to sweep debris out into, uh, into the intestines or out into our, 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 our stool essentially. And when the, uh, the pressure and when the digestive function starts to change and we increase the amount of bloating and gas in the digestive system, this inhibits or alters the function of that migratory motor complex. So not only do we have bacteria making a home in the small intestine when it should be in the large intestine, we have inhibition of this migratory motor complex so we're not sweeping food out as readily. And then we have that changing of home of bacteria which we talked about. So how does this happen? How does someone get SIBO? How do these symptoms occur? Or these issues or mechanism, failures of mechanism occur? So first is the foods we eat. So very common would be your FODMAPs. This is going to be stand for fructo, oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, and polyols. A lot of these um, can be considered prebiotics. So I know we might be a little confusing there. We'll talk about when we want to take probiotics, not prebiotics. Prebiotics can feed the bad bacteria and create um, even a more shift or dis dysbiotic environment. Uh, stomach acid. Stomach acid is really crucial. So if someone has a low, uh, low stomach acid or their stomach, uh, their stomach pH is more alkaline, this can shift or throw off digestive function. So digestion is very crucial and key. It di is dictated and started with correct pH. So we need an acidic environment to signal to the pancreas to open the pyloric sphincter, to signal to the pancreas to release cholecystokinase, CCK, to release peptide YY, to release amylase, lipase, protease, all these enzymes that are crucial in the, the process of digestion. It signals in cretins as well. These are all processes that are really crucial for our digestion that are dictated by pH. So if we change our pH by using uh, antibiotics, long-term or chronic use of antibiotics, chronic or long-term use of antacids or proton pump inhibitors, these can shift the microbiome, shift our digestive function, 
cause us to be more alkaline, less acidic uh, in the stomach, and shift our digestion and, and uh, predispose us to uh, SIBO. Also, we talked about our digestive enzymes and how pH influences that. We talked about the microbiome health and decreasing that motor function as well. So when our digestion gets thrown off, it throws off that migratory motor complex and it can't fire proper, properly and have that sweeping mechanism that we talked about. Here are some common signs and symptoms. The big ones I want you to notice if we have bloating or gas, and this is gonna be pretty much almost all the time, at least for the bloating, we'll have abdominal distension almost all the time with any food. Typically, if you notice it with one or two foods, it could be just because we have a sensitivity or an allergen to that food. Um, the key is, again, having that bloating sensation all the time. That's going to be a real indication to SIBO. We have other things here. So if you notice you have just chronic constipation and this abdominal bloating, it's typically you're probably a higher methane SIBO uh, patient or, or methane driven SIBO. Um, when the bacteria are basically pooping and breeding, they produce methane um, or they'll produce hydrogen. So it's almost like you have a little distillery going on in your stomach when you are when you have SIBO going on. So if you notice chronic constipation, you're probably a methane driven SIBO. If we have chronic diarrhea, this is gonna reflect a, uh, a hydrogen dominant SIBO. So being aware that we also can flip, flip, flip flop back and forth from diarrhea and constipation, that's a possibility. Some other things that you might not realize, some joint pain, brain fog, if we uh, have malnutrition, such as like probably leaky gut or some intestinal permeability, that can lead into SIBO. The key point to the signs and symptoms here is making sure we address the major underlying cause. So if we have like IBD or IBS, irritable bowel syndrome or irritable bowel disease, this can be the root cause to driving to our SIBO. Also, something like mast cell activation, which we'll talk about in depth at a later conversation, can drive SIBO and SIBO-like symptoms. Uh, taking care and removing the antibiotics or removing the long-term use of the PPIs or antiacids can be a root cause to removing the SIBO. So making sure that we're not just treating the SIBO by itself, that we're also looking at any other factors that could be contributing to this. How we test for this. So outside of doing a very invasive uh, scope or uh, biopsy, uh, going in internally and, and doing a biopsy, the gold standard outside of that would be a breath test. Now we need to ask ourselves, there's a couple kinds of breath tests. The two most prominent are gonna be your lactulose and your glucose breath test. After some series of research, it's found that glucose is the preferred method. So basically they ran a study, they looked at people who had IBD and IBS symptoms, doesn't necessarily mean they have SIBO, and then they looked at a control. They basically found that lactulose had reported high presence of SIBO in the controlled and non-controlled, meaning the IBS, IBD uh, cohorts as well. But when they looked at lactulose, so just to reiterate, there wasn't a big discrepancy from the two groups when doing the lactulose breath test. When they did the, high, the glucose uh, breath test, they noticed that there was a, a significant report of SIBO and IBD and IBS, but when they measured and checked the control group, there was not a significant uh, report of SIBO. So it had good clinical, good clinical results when using the glucose hydrogen breath test. So some quick tips on how we correct the SIBO. So implementing a FODMAP diet, avoiding some of those prebiotic foods, and implementing that's gonna help to basically starve, starve out or kill the, the bacteria that is uh, breeding in the, the small intestine. Also making sure you test for candida, seeing if we have a candida or yeast overgrowth after we change the microbiome or shift the microbiome. Also some intermittent fasting will be beneficial because we're literally starving out the bacteria. I would recommend a three day fast. That would be your gold standard to really wipe out as much as you can in a short time period. 
Um, also, balancing your stomach pH, whether it be using betaine hydrochloric acid, whether it be using um, some other Swedish bitters or herbs that increase your stomach pH, or excuse me, decrease your stomach pH, but make your stomach more acidic, that's gonna be beneficial so we start triggering the correct response of digestive system. Uh, helping to aid some of your digestion. So we're making sure we're breaking down some of those smaller food particles. So taking some digestive enzymes to help break down those foods into its smaller constituents. Because if we bring larger food particles into the, the small intestine, the bacteria that translocated will start to feed off it and then create even more SIBO symptoms. Um, some other things, we wanna make sure that we're binding the, the bacteria. So the big thing is the bacteria is sitting in that small intestine. So we need, to, we need to bind it and we need to remove that bacteria. So using bentonite clays, using chlorella, using cilantro, using uh, diatomaceous earth, using some of these good binders to bind that bacteria. And then we need to activate the digestive system. Because remember that motor, that migratory motor complex isn't working as effectively. So getting, using supplements that are kind of considered prokinetics, um, which basically kind of stimulate that migratory motor complex, it stimulates that, that swooshing uh, wave-like contraction. So uh, ginger is gonna be really good. Uh, using some type of dopamine would be really good, whether it be um, L-dopa or some type of macunapurines. Um, those are going to be beneficial for activating and stimulating the digestive tract. Uh, then we want to make sure we now re-inoculate with good probiotics, not prebiotics, good probiotics that now start to kind of rebuild that small intestine, the bacteria in the small intestine and in the stomach, creating a good uh, microbiome, creating eubiosis. And then making sure we're also underlying or addressing any underlying issue. Is it IBD? Is it mast cell? Is it IBS? Is it antibiotics or PPIs that are driving this? Is it, um, is it some type of intestinal permeability that's driving this? Is it our pH that's driving this? So making sure that we're addressing all issues, not just looking at the symptoms of SIBO and trying to remove just the, the bacteria. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to bring you in and have a consult or do a telemedicine consult over this. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact the number or email below. And if there's anyone that you know can benefit from this, please share this video with them. I appreciate your time and have a wonderful day.